is Bread of His Presence with your host, Pastor Cameron Urey, Senior Pastor and Bible Teacher at Renton Park Chapel in Renton, Washington. Hello and welcome to the show today. As always, it is such a joy to have you with us as we study the Word of God together. You know, we've been looking at the story of Noah for several weeks now, marking all the key events of history leading up to Noah, but also noting why it was that Noah found such favor in the eyes of God. And it was because Noah was a man of character, who in the midst of a sin-filled world was walking with God. And so God chooses Noah to be the one through whom the human race and every species of animals might be preserved to replenish the earth after the flood. And so it says in Genesis 6, verses 13 to 16, So God said to Noah, I am going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence because of them. I am surely going to destroy both them and the earth. So make yourself an ark of cypress wood. Make rooms in it and coat it with pitch inside and out. This is how you are to build it. The ark is to be 300 cubits long, 50 cubits wide, and 30 cubits high. Make a roof for it, leaving below the roof an opening one cubit high all around. Put a door in the side of the ark and make lower, middle, and upper decks. Now, the ark also, it wasn't designed for beauty or for speed. No, these dimensions provided extraordinary stability in the midst of the tumultuous floodwaters. A cubit was about 18 inches long, making the ark 450 feet long. 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. So it was pretty much just a gigantic box um, that was able to be and remain stable in the water. Impossible to capsize. And the volume of space in the ark was 1.4 million cubic feet equal to the capacity of 522 standard railroad cars, which could carry about 125,000 sheep. And it had three stories, each 15 feet high, and each deck was equipped with various rooms, literally nests. And each of these decks had an approximate total deck area of 95,700 square feet. Now, the ark, interestingly, had only one door. And that's very, very important because Jesus said, I am the way. And I am the door to the sheepfold. And he is also the door to the ark. And it's interesting to note that it is the Lord who seals the door. And God says in verse 17 and following, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens. Every creature that has the breath of life in it, everything on earth will perish. But I will establish my covenant with you. And you will enter the ark, you and your sons, and your wife, and your sons' wives with you. You are to bring into the ark two of all living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, and of every kind of creature that moves along the ground will come to you to be kept alive. And so God promises to preserve Noah and his family because of his obedience and his righteousness. And he says specifically, I will establish my covenant with you. And the theme of covenant is so important in Scripture. It was usually an agreement made between a conquering party and a conquered party. 
and it usually involved the conquering parties laying out the list of demands that the conquered party has to follow. And yet God takes this form of covenant and he reverses it. Though he is the king of kings, the lord of lords, he makes commitments to those under him. To preserve them, to keep them, to provide for them. And we see that more and more in scripture as the theme progresses. And it's especially revealed to us in Jesus, who submits himself to us by allowing himself to die on a cross in order that our greatest need, our need for redemption, might be met. That is the kind of God that is making this covenant. And so God makes a covenant with Noah to preserve him and his family. But he also seeks to save a remnant of the animals as well. Now, Noah, I mean, he's not a big game hunter or anything like that. He didn't have to go out and chase these animals. No, they came to him. And J. Vernon McGee, he points this out and he says that animals in danger will often do that. He says, I remember the first time that we went into Yosemite Valley when our daughter was just a little kid. She had never seen snow before. And when we put her down in the snow, she began to whimper. But she quit when she looked over and saw a little deer. And McGee says, I believe that we could have gone over and pet that little deer. But realizing the possible danger, of course we didn't approach it. But when I mentioned the deer to the ranger, he laughed. And he said, yes, there's snow up in the high Sierra right now. And when there is snow up there and there's danger, they come down here and are as tame as any animal could possibly be. But the minute the snow melts in spring, they leave this area and you couldn't get within a country mile of any of them. Why? Because when an animal is in danger, he will come to man. And at the time of the flood, McGee says, I don't think Noah had any problem at all because the animals all came to him. And of course, God was involved in that. Now, God continues saying in verse 21, you are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. You know, when my family went to see the Ark Encounter in Kentucky, where Answers in Genesis has built this full-scale ark in the dimensions given to us in Scripture, one of the things that amazed us when we came into the ark was just how many pots and jars there were full of food and water. And I guess I'd never really thought in depth before about just how much food you would have to have on an ark with that many animals. But it was incredible to see that because of the ark's dimensions, there was definitely more than enough room for the food that they needed. But it must have been an enormous amount of work to get that food on board and to be feeding all those animals day in and day out. But it tells us in verse 22, Noah did everything just as God commanded him. And so once again, we see Noah's faith demonstrated in that he obeys and actively trusts God. And it is that faith that God responds to. You know, it's been said that faith honors God and God honors faith. You know, a story from the life of missionaries, Robert and Mary Moffat, illustrates this truth. For ten years, this couple labored faithfully in Bakwana land, now called Botswana, without one ray of encouragement to brighten their way. They couldn't report a single convert. And finally, the directors of their mission board began to question the wisdom of continuing the work. 
but the thought of leaving their post brought such grief to this incredibly devoted couple because they felt sure that God was in their labors and that they would see people turn to Christ in due season. And so they stayed. And for a year or two longer, darkness reigned. But then one day, a friend in England sent word to the Moffats that she wanted to mail them a gift and asked what they would like. Trusting that in time the Lord would bless their work, Mrs. Moffat replied, Send us a communion set. I am sure it will soon be needed. And God honored that dear woman's faith, because the Holy Spirit moved upon the hearts of the villagers, and soon a little group of six converts was united to form the first Christian church in that land. The communion set from England was delayed in the mail, but on the very day before the first commemoration of the Lord's Supper in Bukwana land, the set arrived. You know, George Mueller once said, Faith does not operate in the realm of the possible. There is no glory for God in that which is humanly possible. Faith begins where man's power ends. Let me ask you today, what promises are you banking on? What is your communion set? In what way are you preparing for God to move? That is what the ark was for Noah. It was his preparing for God to move. And it was a step of faith that consumed 100 years of his life. You know what's interesting? Noah's faithfulness in the form of a great ark became one of the early church's symbols for refuge. The interiors of many great cathedrals were built to resemble the inside of a boat, a shelter in the time of a storm, a reminder of one obedient man who went before us and was saved. Noah was obedient to God. And this ought to be a model for you and me as well. Sometimes what God tells us to do just doesn't make any sense. And so the question comes down to, are we going to take that step of faith? That's something each and every one of us needs to commit to as individuals. How are we going to respond when God calls us? Let us commit to obey and to, in faith, follow Him. Let's do so. Amen. Today's episode of Bread of His Presence is brought to you by Renton Park Chapel, a church that is committed to the ministry of sharing the joy of hearing and doing God's Word and to the mission of bringing people into the life-giving presence of Jesus Christ in and through vibrant preaching, teaching, Bible study, prayer, and ministry to a world that is in desperate need of the healing touch of Jesus Christ. If you'd like to learn more about our ministry here at Renton Park Chapel or would like to subscribe to the Bread of His Presence podcast, you can visit us online at rentonparkchapel.org or breadofhispresence.org. You can also find us on Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. We look forward to hearing from you. Thank you for listening. And may you know all the fullness of having in your life the bread of the presence of God.